Over the years, as I've been continuing to research COVID, I have seen some things that are actually very, very concerning. I'm going to share with you an insight into one of them, and I'm only feeling comfortable to talk about this a little bit more publicly because some of the censorship, some, not all, because I'm still having videos and so on being censored, has backed off a little bit. The call yesterday from President Trump with regards to getting more answers from industry as to what's going on, why there are so many variations in thinking in terms of the, the outcomes of the pandemic. It indicates that maybe the scientific community and the public is ready to start hearing what some of the realities are. I've been criticized many times for taking a stance that is critical of what has happened and why am I not more supportive especially as a medic you know I should know better the problem is is that I do know better I have been following this for a very long time and I'm going to give you a quick insight into one of the most significant areas that I had focused on from about early 2023 and I did a whole presentation on it. It was a hidden away to some extent, the mortality data analyzed. And um, I'll kind of give you an insight into what I had done. And at that time, I didn't have AI. And so I had to do this kind of work manually. And what I did is I got the ONS statistics looking at the UK mortality age standardized mortality rates by vaccination status for all cause deaths, looking at 100,000 person years. And this is a big document if to make, um, you know, it's huge. And it's looking at in terms of year up to 2022, December 2022, first dose, second dose, ever vaccinated, unvaccinated. It's a huge document. And as I said, I didn't have AI. So I had to manually go through this and collate this information in order for it to make sense to try and figure out what I was looking at. I've only recently done the exercise of actually taking that information that I did, putting it in AI to say, okay, cross check it, see whether or not I got any of the analysis wrong. I didn't. And so I know that this is a very, very important point. So, what is this really about? In essence, I knew that there were a lot of people who were getting sick. The question is, who and why? And this is what is relevant. So at that time, I'd focused primarily on autoimmunity. This was the prediction that we made in 2020. This is the autoimmune response where the virus and the um, and ACE2 bind together. And then the immune system produces autoantibodies targeting ACE2 in different parts of the body. And this was my, my structure that I have used for the past number of years to be able to extrapolate the science. So I'm not going through that in any great detail. But there was one thing that I thought was very relevant, and this was what we call hypermetabolic lymphadenopathy. And I say long COVID because they call any symptoms around COVID as long COVID. But it's actually a little bit more complex than that because a lot of people have symptoms that they don't directly correlate in terms of long COVID. And the principle that I looked at was very simple. When you look at what happens with regards to vaccination, you should get some inflammation at most in one of the draining lymph nodes. And usually the lymph nodes don't get too swollen. And this is what then causes the immune response. So with that knowledge, there was an unusual pattern that occurred in Israel where they found that there was very high uptake of this FDG, which is labeled glucose, and they use it to screen for cancer. And they found in some lymph nodes there was mild, moderate, high, high with an enlarged lymph node. None of this is normal. So you don't normally see this. Even the mild is not really normal. But the point is, is that this was P53 
picked up so much so that they couldn't do the uh, cancer screening because they had to wait about three months for it to settle down. And this is the important slide in terms of that impact of the dose in terms of hypermetabolic. Now the darkest brown, yellowish brown here, within four days, 15% of people had enlarged node with um, high uptake. And this fell gradually down to 2% by greater than 25 days. Now, 2% is still a lot because if you think that 2% of the population who had been vaccinated still had enlarged lymph nodes, grade four um, vaccine associated um, uh, hypermetabolic lymphadenopathy, that is a significant percentage. So I used that framework to then say, the people who had the strongest immune response may be at greatest risk for long-term symptoms. Now, at the time, they were telling people, if you had, if you felt unwell after being vaccinated, that was a good thing. N no, that's an adverse re reaction. You don't actually want people to feel unwell. You just want them to have an immune response. But my instinct was that the people who had the most significant immune response and felt most unwell could be at highest risk. So this was my assumption. So when I then did the review of the data, what I then did is that this was me reviewing the data. I then took all of that Excel document. And um, if you are just coming, this is what it looks like. I took this huge document with all of this information up to 570 lines of information. I had to put it together so that it made sense. So I took all of that together and then I went about trying to review the data. And this is what I found at the time. So I selected a time frame where the numbers were stable. And so this was between June 2022 to December 2022. So this was where you had the uptake, highest uptake of um, people who are taking the vaccine. You can see all of these lines here up as people take one, two, three booster doses. And then by this period, it has largely stabilized. And so I took this period to look at what were the outcomes with regards to mortality in this six month period. And then what I saw was very interesting. Well, when you looked at COVID-19 by vaccination status, and this is on the left here, was the age standardized mortality rate per 100,000. So the higher the mortality, the more people who would die. And in terms of colors, red is first dose, greater than 21 days. Purple is unvaccinated. Green is they had a second dose, but it was beyond two months, six months, ever vaccinated and third booster. Now, you will notice down here that the booster dose greater than 21 days and the ever vaccinated, anybody who had a vaccine was down here. And this was in terms of COVID-19, which makes sense. They had low risk of severe covid if someone was unvaccinated and at high risk, they could have a higher risk of COVID. But for those who only had two doses greater than six months, it didn't seem that they had any greater protection. What is the standout here is the first dose. If they only had one dose, they seem to have higher risk. This in itself was my red flag. Because my question is, if somebody went to take the time to get a dose, why would they only take one? Because you only had to get the other one after about three or four weeks. It usually suggests, that was my assumption, that they oftentimes had some kind of response that caused them to not want to take the second dose. In my view, that's an adverse response. They had a strong immune response. They felt very unwell with it. So they thought, you know what, I'm not taking a second dose. That's what I was looking for in terms of the hypermetabolic response. That was my assumption, is that the two things could be correlated, and that could be about 2% of the population. Now, here is the bit 
that I considered most significant. When I collated the data over the six month period of time, and the what I did is, COVID was one side of it, but it broke it down into COVID and non-COVID deaths. Okay, so you remember this was between June to December 2022 when you had the Omicron wave. And so therefore, it just wasn't as lethal as the Delta wave. So you had less people dying with COVID, but excess deaths were still up. Why were people still dying? This, in my mind, was the red flag. When I looked at non-COVID deaths by vaccination status, June 22 to December 22, and they have here age standardized mortality per 100,000. This is the unvaccinated hovering at about 1,000 um, 1, per 100,000 person years. At about 1,500 is the second dose greater than six months. And up here at about 1,750 up to 2,000 is the first dose greater than 21 days. So what it meant is that people who only had one dose seemed to consistently have a significantly higher mortality than somebody who was unvaccinated. This does seem as though it is a little bit trending down. As people died, they're less likely to uh, have uh, a higher risk Similarly, as the unvaccinated also trended down, same with this, it's trending downwards. Because as people died, the percentage, my view was that if you thought 2% had these adverse res responses based on the hypermetabolic lymph lymphadenopathy, as they died, the risk would come down over the cohort. But this, to me, was the most serious flag first dose greater than 21 days. The question that I thought at the time that needed to be answered by public health was why did somebody only take one dose? What they should have done, in my view, is that if you had the vaccine um, campaign, if people were mandated and so on, and they took only a single dose, one either they got out of the job or something and they didn't uh, do it. You should have checked up on them anyway to make sure that they have got things in order financially if they lost their job and so on. But you'd want to look specifically at people who took only one dose and had an adverse response. That's how you would find them. And what I thought is that we should be looking out for this cohort. And I'm saying it to you now publicly for the one of the first times I've ever said anything like this. If you know someone who had only one dose, ask them why, okay? Now, if it was that they said, I can't, couldn't be bothered, you know, it, it, I just decided I, I wasn't interested in it, fine. But you want to know if they had an adverse response. Because if they had an adverse response, are they at increased risk down the line? Because that's the public health question. It's like if somebody has hypertension, they have increased risk of stroke and heart disease and so on, and you want to manage it. If people who only had one dose and had adverse responses are at higher risk, and I say, if, I don't know this for certain, this is my extrapolation based on the data. If that is the case, we need to know because you would then have a cohort of your population who is at high risk for complications for which you are doing absolutely nothing about. That's my thought. And here was my, in my summary, important questions from the data, final point. Why is there a higher risk for COVID mortality and non-COVID mortality in the first dose at least 21 days? What are the demographic characteristics of this group? Did they have ad adverse events which impacted on them taking a second dose? And if so, what risks exist in the longer term? How can they be identified, investigated, and preemptively mitigated 
to reduce their risk? And why is there no significant COVID-19 protection after six months with the second dose that was with Omicron? So these were the questions that I had, and this was all the way from early 2023. So we're almost two years down the line with this. And what you must remember, therefore, is that when I'm speaking about these things, when I'm speaking to you about aortic inflammation, when I'm speaking to you about the COVID storm, This information takes years. It may take two to three years for information to become considered part of the general scientific consensus. I just happen to be talking to you about this research and the relevance of this research in terms of the science. My point, though, for you, if you happen to be watching this, is please, if you only had one dose, reflect carefully on why that is the case. If you had an adverse response, we need to figure out whether or not you or your loved one or your friend or your aunt or your coworker is at higher risk. And if they are, what can we do to mitigate that risk? That's what we're trying to work out. Let's see if we can find solutions. As a final reminder, please remember, COVID's hidden time bomb, rapid arterial aging. The link is in the description below. And most importantly, remember to like, subscribe, and comment. It helps the algorithm. Have a great evening.